Excellent. Um, folks, uh, hello and welcome to this webinar hosted by the Jacobs Levy Equity Management Center for Quantitative Financial Research at the Wharton School. Uh, my name is Chris Gatesy, and I am one of the academic directors of the center, along with Craig McKinn. We're also joined by Managing Director Lauren Hurry. Today's webinar is going to focus on the working paper, Almost 200 Years of News-Based Economic Sentiment by Jules Van Binsbergen of Wharton and his co-authors from London Business School. It will be presented by Jules and discussed by Wharton alumnus Orv Saxena of Silver Lake. Today's event is both a webinar and a virtual continuation of Jacob Levy Center's Quant Around the World series, in which we highlight new research in the field of quant finance for audiences and locations around the world. We're pleased to co-host this event with the Wharton Club of the United Kingdom. The club's mission is to bring together Wharton alumni based in the UK, continue to share and learn, and we at the Jacobs Levy Center are happy to be a part of that today. We thank the club for partnering with us on planning, particularly George Gatashiani, for his efforts. Thank you, George. Welcome to those joining from the UK, Europe, and of course, welcome to all our uh, participants and in the Jacobs Levy family. Uh, I know many of you are familiar with the center and have attended our past webinars and conferences. For any newcomers, our mission is to advance research in quantitative finance that sits at the intersection of theory and practice. The center awards doctoral fellowships and research grants to Wharton and, and faculty, as well as student projects. It maintains a paper series on SSRN and hosts events like this and our annual conference, which will be happening in the fall. The Jacobs Levy Center and the Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize for Quantitative Financial Innovation were established through the vision and generosity of Wharton alumni, Bruce Jacobs and Ken Lee, who made a gift to Wharton to commemorate the 25th anniversary of their firm, Jacobs Levy Equity Management. Bruce and Ken have helped play a major role in bringing quant investing to the forefront, publishing a series of significant articles in leading professional journals, co-authoring well-regarded books, and generously fostering scholarship and finance. We thank them for their ongoing support, involvement, and munificence, which have helped uh, ensure Wharton is at the forefront of the field of quant finance. I'll hand things off shortly to Jules to present his paper, which uses the full text of 200 million pages of 13,000 US local newspapers and state-of-the-art machine learning methods, uh, which is on the lips of everybody, uh, to construct a novel time series measure of economic sentiment. It impressively spans, as the title indicates, almost 200 years, which of course uh, I have an affinity for. Uh, but first, a bit more about our speakers. Jules Van Binsbergen is the Nippon Life Professor in Finance at Wharton and was previously a tenured faculty member at Stanford's Graduate School of His research focuses on asset pricing, particularly the relationship between financial markets and the macro and the organization's skill and performance of financial intermediaries. Some of his recent work focuses on the influence of financial market anomalies on real economic activity, measuring the skill of mutual fund managers and the term structure of cash flow growth and stock return predictability. His research has appeared in leading academic journals, including the American Economic Review, the Journal of Finance, the Journal of Financial Economics, and the Journal of Monetary Economics. In addition, Jules and Jonathan Burke have been hosting really interesting uh, podcast series called all Else Equal, which I think you'll uh, really enjoy if you haven't had a chance to check it out. Uh, our discussant today, uh, Apoor Saxena, is a managing director and chief data scientist at Silver Lake. In previous roles, he was the global head of artificial intelligence and machine learning services at JP Morgan Chase, a product and business leader for multiple AI products at Google Cloud, and the co-founder of AI Frontiers, the leading applied AI conference in the Bay Area. He also worked at McKinsey and Alcatel-Lucent, where he focused on delivering impact across strategy operations, design and build, and sales and marketing for clients in the financial and tech industry. He's an alumnus of the Wharton MBA program. Welcome, Apoorv and Jules. Now, uh, Jules' presentation will be recorded and available on the Jacobs Levy Center's website after this event, but please note that Apoorv's discussion is off the record and will not be recorded. We'll have Q&A uh, after the discussion, which we intend to record, although it will be edited after the webinar. Uh, if you have questions, I encourage you to submit it by the chat at any point at all. Uh, and please note uh, whether you are comfortable being called on to ask your question. Uh, if you want me to ask it, for example, uh, just don't um, say that you're willing to, to answer or to ask it. Uh, we'll try to do that when possible to help make today's presentation interact. So now I'll turn it over uh, to Jules. Jules? Well, first, Chris, thank you so much for the very nice introduction. And let me already 
thank Apoor for taking the time to uh, discuss the paper, which I'm very grateful for. And of course, to Lauren for putting everything together. Um, so this is uh, this paper is called, as Chris said, almost 200 years of news-based economic sentiment. Um, and the, the, the main uh, thing that we want to go after is the question of sentiment is receiving quite a bit of attention recently in financial markets, uh, also uh, when it comes to predicting economic growth and the role that it may have in the economic decisions that agents make. Um, and one of the key challenges that we thought that this literature has is that surveys uh, uh, and such as such as the Michigan survey, which I'll talk about quite a bit, um, are relatively short lived. Um, they target very few economic objects. Uh, and most importantly, uh, they don't actually uh, cover a lot of granularity, meaning, uh, say, for example, you wanted to have economic sentiment measures uh, at the state level or at the county level or at the city level. And so what we're going to try to do in this paper is to expand these existing measures of economic sentiment to not only a longer time series, but also a larger cross section and see where uh, economic sentiment can be useful, particularly from a prediction uh, point of view. And so in this paper, we're going to get uh, present a national and local at this point state level news based economic sentiment measure for about 170 years. Now, what are we going to use for this? Um, we're going to use um, uh, a very large number of local newspapers in the United States. The advantage of the local newspapers is that they also report local economic news, meaning that they do have economic uh, statements regarding the cities or the, even the, the, the counties or the cities uh, that these newspapers are distributed um, at. Now, of course, there are some uh, national newspapers as well. Uh, but we, we, we are going to focus on both, but we're going to use, particularly if there are local newspapers, that local information to construct these local sentiment measures um, at the state level. Um, we're going to use machine learning techniques to try to figure out how positive or negative these newspapers are about the current economic condition. So, and we're going to, again, then distinguish between how positive or negative they are about local economic conditions, as well as uh, national economic conditions. Unfortunately, we will not be spending much time on international uh, economic conditions. It will mainly be uh, uh, focused on the United States at this point. Okay? And so we're going to ask the question, what is the information locally and globally in the news, and how does it impact uh, the economy? We're going to use, the, in terms of methods, uh, we're just going to use neural networks, this word to vec method, um, as well as uh, sentiment uh, type measures from Hamilton. Now, I do want to make one clarification before we proceed, which is this. What exactly does the word sentiment mean? And uh, as I think we can all agree, it's not so easy to define that, particularly um, as soon as you say in finance and in the more rational finance departments, the word sentiment, what people immediately think about is behavioral finance, meaning there is something happening that a rational agent wouldn't be doing. Now, given how we're going to approach the problem, I want you to think about sentiment in a, a, a more general setting, in the sense that we are simply going to measure in newspapers how the news is reported and how positive or negative the information about economic news is reported in, uh, in the news. And so it is possible there that there's a part of it that is just factual um, positive or negative information. So there's an information channel there. It's also possible that there's overreaction there, meaning that it's overly optimistically reported or, um, uh, or maybe too negatively reported. And so we're going to take a look at um, what is the type of news that this sentiment measure actually in, incorporates in the sense that we're going to ask the question, does it predict cash flows or does it more predict discount rates? And so we are going to be closer, much closer to focusing on real economic quantities and their predictability. Say, um, we are going to find large predictability of these sentiment measures for, say, GDP growth and also, by the way, for uh, monetary policy over and above uh, what, say, Romer and Romer-Taylor type rules have. But um, we are not going to be finding much 
for stock return predictability. And so I think that is important. Now, several people have asked, well, yeah, maybe not at the aggregate level, but certainly in the cross-section, there must be something you can do. We have not yet looked at that. So what we're going to focus on in this paper first is how much can economic sentiment help us forecast economic growth and monetary policy over and above what uh, professional forecasters are doing. And so in that sense, there is a little bit of behavioral tilt after all to the paper in the sense that our sentiment measure is going to be leading the expert forecasts uh, forecast for GDP, meaning there's information in our sentiment that apparently is not making it into the expert forecast of GDP growth. And so clearly there's, there's, these people could be making better forecasts of GDP growth and other economic quantities than what they're currently are doing if they would incorporate um, the uh, sentiment that we are measuring uh, in the newspapers. So let me tell you what we find. So first, sentiment has a very clear business cycle pattern. Uh, that's one. Two, we're going to find that over the common sample, it co-moves quite closely with existing measures like the Michigan survey. And so just to be clear, there was nothing in our procedure or in our measurement that in any way used information directly from the surveys that the Michigan survey did. And yet it does seem that over the common sample, we seem to be picking up quite a bit of the same information. Now, of course, the advantage of ours is that we go to a much larger cross-section across states, and we're going to go back further by about 100 years. So for those people that want to use Michigan survey type analyses, but are missing out on the data of the 100 years before that, it sounds like our sentiment measure seems to be a very good stand-in uh, for that Michigan survey data. So as I said, our measure seems to lead uh, the survey professional forecasters when it comes to forecasting GDP growth. And so we find but that it predicts GDP growth, employment, consumption, and services uh, controlling for past fundamentals. So we are going to be controlling for those forecasting variables that many others have used before to try to forecast GDP growth and uh, things like the yield spreads uh, and lag GDP growth. And we find that our sentiment measure outperforms that. And there's substantial information in that sentiment measure for that. And then finally, um, our sentiment measure seems to have, particularly during recessions, a quite a bit of forecasting power for the Fed funds rate, um, in addition, over and above these Romer and Romer Taylor type rules. So again, there are two interpretations that we're going to be thinking about. Um, the first interpretation is the Fed is overreacting to the sentiment measure meaning uh, because there is negative sentiment about recessions coming, the Fed is cutting interest rates too aggressively. That's one interpretation of our result. Although we also have shown that um, because our measure predicts GDP growth, maybe it's the case that the Fed actually does incorporate that information already in the setting of the Fed funds rate and therefore is better able to forecast GDP growth. And um, we actually find that even for controlling for the better GDP growth, there still seems to be quite a large reaction of the Fed to this uh, negative news reporting in the newspaper. So over and above better GDP growth forecasting, there seems to be an additional Fed effect uh, that we're going to be talking about. So that was all at the country level. And then at the state level, um, we find that economic sentiment actually predicts local GDP growth as well. So meaning um, we can really uh, look at a state level and see what part of sentiment is unique to the state. So we're going to find that only about 35% of sentiment movements across the newspapers is a common component. Uh, you can think of it as a first principle component across all of the different states. And the remainder of the variation seems to be quite state specific. And that state specific information does seem to have forecasting power for local GDP growth um, as well. And then finally, we find, um, and, and there's, there's, there's a bit more thinking that we can do about that, what that means, but there is the clear empirical result that if there's a large sentiment dispersion across states, that means that at the national level, we're predicting lower uh, GDP growth. So uh, the discord, if you will, about sentiment across different states is not good news for um, aggregate GDP growth in the United States. So let me, um, I'm going to quickly run you because I don't have a lot of time 
Um, I'm going to quickly run you through the procedure that we're doing. Then I'm going to show you what the, particularly the time series of the sentiment index looks like. And I'll show you some of the predictability results and uh, what the potential channels are for that. All right, so we have 13,000 local newspapers, 200 million newspaper pages, um, around 2 billion articles. So um, it is a 95 times larger than all of the English language Wikipedia. So it's an enormous amount of information. Um, we're also going to be using the Madison Project database for long-term GDP growth data. Um, I, I would recommend everybody to look at this data. I think uh, as economists, we are way too familiar, but, and I've done quite a bit of work in other papers on this, with uh, economic growth over, since 1800, say. But what we, the economic growth data that we have also before that is quite depressing. Uh, uh, we've essentially had 500 years of no economic growth between 1300 and 1800 before the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. And so I think there's, there's a lot to learn from that data, particularly given the secular declines in growth that we're seeing around the world today. Um, this is the newspaper coverage uh, across states. And you see here in red, two to seven, uh, uh, the, the, the ranges of the number of uh, newspapers. So you see in, in the, the red states are the ones with the lowest number of newspapers and green with the most. The data set covers 47 states for at least 100 years um, out of 170 years that we have data for. Now, how are we going to go about uh, measuring sentiment? So the first thing that we need to do is create a dictionary of relevant words for the topic economics. Right? And so therefore, we are going to use these standard techniques based on a number of seed words to try to put together a dictionary that broadly relates to um, uh, the, the topic of economics. Then we're going to, uh, uh, after we've created that quite large dictionary uh, with economic words, we're going to identify a specific set of words that are associated with positive or negative economic news. Now, by the way, one thing that I think is already interesting to mention, because it's a question that we get a lot, is, is the way that we talk about economics in 1870 the same way that we talk about economics in 2020? And the answer is actually, yes, it is. So a lot of the, if you make word clouds of economic words that are being used in this earlier sample versus word clouds that are used in the very last part of the sample, you'd be surprised how many of the words overlap. Now, of course, that was also due to the fact that most of the economic language that we use today are, of course, uh, the, the, the inheritance of the work of Adam Smith and others, where, uh, where particular ways of describing the business cycle and the economy have uh, remained quite constant. So, so just already to preempt that, we, are, we were very worried about the fact that the way people talk about economics might have changed over time. But after doing much of that analysis, we're much less concerned uh, about that issue. Um, so then we're also going to uh, apply the dictionary to measure the intensity of positive and negative sentiment in a particular document. And then we're going to find, uh, so, so for every uh, newspaper article, and particularly the pages in which economic news is reported, we can now give it a score of how positive or negative uh, that particular economic page has been. Now, uh, a couple of other details that are interesting. It is possible to um, what's called make bigrams and trigrams as well. So think of it as um, it's not just individual words, but sometimes you also uh, want to have uh, words glued together that you treat as one word. So for example, Chairman Powell could be, it's two words officially, but you can, uh, on a smart way, combine them as one entry. So therefore, that in the word recognition, you even have two or three word phrases that are all um, uh, together. So inflation adjustment or inflation adjusted, things like that. You can all uh, make sure that, that we're, we're incorporating even not just individual words, but more uh, phrases in economics as well. Um, so here you see uh, a word cloud of words related to the word economy. As I said, we've done words clouds like this uh, for many different decades uh, and, and longer time periods as well to see how it tracks over time. And these word clouds, this is over the whole sample, um, but, but if, that already gives you some indication that if, if you simply look at these words, there's really nothing there where you say, hey, here's really a word that, that doesn't look to me like it's still used in the English language today. <laughs> 
Then we're going to isolate positive or negative words. Um, and so the seed words that we use uh, for positive words are things like expansion, boom, growth, profit, optimistic, optimism, opportunity, success, successful, and so forth. If you look at the list of negative words, um, you will find a similar uh, uh, sort of recognizable words that I think uh, you, you would also put in a newspaper article if it was about bad economic news. And now, given these word to vec types of algorithms, you can find all kinds of other words that in this vector space, because these word to vec things means literally that we represent words in a vector space. And because we have them represented in a vector space, you can measure their closeness to other words that are similar, uh, particularly based on the context in which they are being used. Uh, and so then the, the last step is that we're going to follow Hamilton and um, to really think about the context of the word in terms of what the sentiment means, right? So for example, um, if you use the word soft in the context of an athletic performance, it means something very different than soft in the context of a, 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 a toy that you buy for your child, a, a plush animal. And so it's very important if you want to attach sentiment to something in the meaning of a word, that the context of the word in which it's used is incorporated properly. Um, otherwise, it's very difficult to really give meaning to the sentiment. And so this work by Hamilton at all, I think, made big steps forward in that. And so that is what we're using here, too. All right. Um, so then uh, the last step that we need to do is just simply aggregate. Um, now, the aggregation, um, as you can imagine, th there's a lot of commonality in, 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 a, in a couple words that are used a lot in particular pages. So if once we have given scores and sentiment and economic sentiment scores to particular pages, um, how do you aggregate that? Um, it, of course, the most important thing is the cross-sectional variation that we have. And so therefore, in the aggregation step, we use this Aurora et al. algorithm to take out common components and really focus on what is unique uh, between different uh, uh, pages to get to scores of uh, sentiment and cross-sectional variation in that. Um, okay, I'm going to skip most of this. So here is the quarterly measure of raw economic sentiment from 1850 to 2020. And so th the first thing that I would like you to notice here, which was quite shocking to me, is that starting in 1970, um, we really are observing quite a bit of a negative trend, right? And so um, you can see that essentially the news, the way it's reported today, has never been as negative in terms of its sentiment as it has been in the past 170 years. Now, you do see that it goes up a little bit um, during the dot-com uh, period, but you also see that in the dot-com era, there's a very big drop down. Then, of course, the financial crisis is a very big drop down. Uh, and then uh, COVID also has a, a large spike down, although we only um, captured the beginning of that because that's where our sample um, ends. And so the question is, what causes this overall trend in the negativity in the news? Now, there are two explanations here. The first one is this downward trend does seem to coincide with um, what we call the secular stagnation period in the economic growth literature, which is that since 1970, gradually GDP growth and particularly TFP growth uh, have been gradually slowing down. And therefore, these events where you see the large drop downs have been bad news for long term economic growth, not just for short term economic growth. Um, so that's one explanation. The other explanation is, of course, that um, and, and we find some evidence for this we can compare the overall negativity in the newspaper with the negativity that we see in the economic news. And as it turns out, um, the overall negativity in the newspaper is even worse when it comes to um, this overall time trend. So you see that if, if you focus not so much on the economic news, but also general sentiment, then you can see that essentially starting in the 70s, um, we're on this massive downward trend with even very little variation. Uh, in that trend. So if anything, the economic news during the dot-com bubble was an outlier in terms of its positivity relative to this overall negative trend in general sentiment. And so uh, to tell you the truth, I mean, this paper is mostly about economic growth, but I think there's a whole separate paper to think about the incentives from a newspaper perspective 
of trying to sell news by being increasingly negative, because obviously bad news sells much better than positive news does. Uh, but but if, if you look at that blue line and you see how negative the news is today compared to essentially uh, the 150 years before that, uh, that is a disconcerting trend that uh, I, I will not spend much more time on today in today's talk, but I do want you to know that that result is also uh, in the paper. So let's then look at the residual between the red line and the blue line, meaning I'm going to, in some sense, detrend the sentiment measure with this general sentiment. And then here you see uh, the economic sentiment measure. So it's the residual of the red and the blue line. Um, and then you, ca you can see here uh, the dot com boom is clearly a very high point. Another thing that surprised me was that World War II was actually a period of a lot of positive reporting in the newspaper, right? So you see the sentiment measure generally going up, not down. Now, again, there can be many reasons for why it's chosen to report positive news during such an event, maybe to keep morale up or other things, but it is, it is interesting. You do see very uh, negative sentiment during the Great Depression, um, sorry, the Long Depression, um, which is uh, this 1870 to 1890 period. Um, you also see that uh, a very large drop uh, during the Great Depression. And if anything, uh, the Second World War uh, pulled people out of that uh, Great Depression dip. Um, the oil crises were bad. Um, and as I said, the, the financial crisis was uh, bad. The dot-com uh, bubble was bad. The European debt crisis was bad and so forth. Now, how does our measure line up against the, the Michigan Consumer Survey? So you see here the red and the blue line against each other. So um, you see the, the, the Michigan uh, measure and the R measure actually lines up quite well with the exception of that very end of the sample, right? At the very end of the sample, you see that we diverge a, a little bit uh, where our sentiment measure seems to be um, uh, more negative than uh, the consumer sentiment. So the Michigan measure is simply the surveys with consumers. So that's the blue line. Uh, we are the new sentiment measure, which is the red line. But overall, um, particularly if you would exclude that last part, you actually have quite a high correlation, even with that uh, divergence at the end included, um, it's still 68% positively correlated. And not just positively correlated, by the way, at the low frequency, but there are also many of the spikes and drops uh, at the high frequency that seem to be coinciding. All right, so then um, how about uh, forecastability? Um, is it the case that sentiment can help predict GDP growth? And so here you see as a dependent variable uh, log GDP, changes in log GDP, and we regressed that against lags of GDP. By the way, you can use more than one lag. You can use up to five lags of lag GDP. It doesn't make much difference for these forecasting regressions, as well as the term spread. And what you see is that the sentiment measure, particularly over the past quarter, but even up to a couple quarters, maybe up to a year or so, several of the lag sentiment changes show up significantly in the regression. In terms of predictive power, it seems that the sentiment measure is about of equal explanatory power and significance as the yield spread is. Um, now, this is all quarterly data. What about, um, uh, what about annual data? So here you see uh, what, what the forecasting power is there. Um, a couple things that are interesting to note here, you see that the coefficient is, is around two. It's a little lower um, at the end, but one of the reasons why it's a little lower at the end as well is of course, because um, the volatility of GDP growth that is there to be explained is quite a bit lower uh, in those that last 40 year period than it is before that. Meaning that uh, recessions and expansions were more aggressive in the early part of our sample and the later part of our sample, given the fact that the volatility of sentiment doesn't seem to be changing uh, that much, the logical conclusion is that the coefficient on the regression will just be a bit lower, but that, that in no means um, undermines its statistical significance here. Uh, then can we use our sentiment measure to forecast um, the, the forecasters, if you will? And as you can see, um, sentiment uh, actually does have forecasting power, quite quite a bit of forecasting power um, 
over and above um, uh, the, uh, for, I should say, for the GDP forecasters, so the survey of professional forecasters. So it does seem that our sentiment measure seems to lead their forecasts. Um, so then we do another exercise that our machine learning algorithm allows us to do, which is we can use based on the on the whether or not future tense or present tense is used, as well as a collection of words that is used to describe the future versus today, we can separate out economic news that specifically speaks about the future versus things that are happening now. And so if we separate out in the word count the future from the present, we actually find, as we would, hope to, would have hoped to find, that the significant predictive power of sentiment is coming from the uh, future statements that are being made, not the, the, the current uh, or past statements that are being made. All right, so if sentiment predicts GDP, if we look at the factors of input, the input factors to GDP, meaning labor and capital, which one of the two does it predict? And as it turns out, our measure seems to be much more related to the labor side of things than it is to the uh, investment side of things. So there's not much for, uh, forecastability for investment in industrial production where we are finding forecasting power, particularly is for employment, right? So it does seem that particularly over the one year horizon sentiment seems to me a dr major driver of employment decisions. Um, and then finally, um, what about um, the uh, federal funds policy? So we're going to ask the question, does sentiment affect monetary policy decisions over and above what standard Taylor rule specifications, particularly the Romer and Romer specification of the Taylor rule? Um, and what you can see there is um, two uh, uh, indicators. Look at specification three that has the blue box around it. We do see that there is an effect of sentiment on changes in the Fed funds rate. And then the second line where it says the times RES is the interaction dummy with whether or not we're uh, in a recession, yes or no. And so you do see there that large asymmetry, which seems that the effect of sentiment on monetary policy seems to be larger during recessions uh, rather than during expansions. All right. Um, finally, um, there's substantial variation in local economic sentiment. So we do. So here you just see uh, three states. You see the, the the sentiment for three different states, and you see that they can uh, uh, deviate from each other quite a bit. As we said, the national trend only accounts for about 35% of the variation in state sentiment. Just to give you some examples, right? So the popping of the dot-com bubble led to particularly bad sentiment, economic sentiment um, in California, uh, if you compare that to say New York, right? So whereas if you look at the financial crisis, it is quite the opposite. So there, the, the economic sentiment in New York during the financial crisis was way worse uh, than it was in California. So different events seem to affect different states in different ways. Uh, which again is, is, is a whole interesting topic for study in and of itself. Um, and then finally, the final result, I'm now really out of time, I think. Um, Chris told me to do to 30 minutes to 40 minutes. So, um, so statewide dispersion um, in economic sentiment seems to have um, forecasting power for, um, for national economic growth and quite strongly so. Uh, we also tried whether or not sentiment would have some predictive power for inflation, which is something that we expected to happen. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really also then from the Fed's point of view, because we did see that it had forecasting power for uh, Fed funds rate, that does not seem to be uh, operating through a for extra forecasting through inflation, right? It all seems to be through growth, economic growth, GDP growth channel. All right. So um, let me conclude. So what we want to do in this paper is ask the question of, can we get economic sentiment measures from newspaper articles um, over the last 170 years? And the answer is yes, we can. Uh, and there are quite a few interesting things that come out of that. In particular, we find that economic sentiment has business cycle movement. It does seem to have predictive power for economic growth. There are large differences between states in terms of how economic sentiment is being 
um, experience. That sentiment across states has differential predictive power for the economic growth in that state. That sentiment seems to operate mainly to the labor market channel, meaning it's hiring decisions and labor that seems to be affected by a sentiment, not so much the capital goods side of things. Um, the last thing uh, that I, I, I want to uh, give you, which I think is sort of, sort of a, a, a conundrum that we're trying to deal with, which is, and, and it would be great to have some discussion about that, which is what next? Meaning the advantage of the sample period that we have studied is that newspapers were generally viewed as an authoritative source for information. So if you look at the younger generations today, many of them do not read newspapers anymore. So the question now is, if you wanted to construct economic sentiment measures today, say for the next 10 years, would you still use local newspapers as your main source to do that, right? For 1870, that seems perfectly fine, but for 2025 or 2030, that seems tougher. If we would go to more online sources to measure economic sentiment, first of all, we lose the local geographical dimension to it because everybody's online in various ways. Maybe we can try to find out where the IP addresses come from. But more importantly, it seems to be quite difficult to then assign much authority to uh, the sources that we're studying. Is if we would go, for example, to Twitter today, and we would look at the general sentiment on Twitter, I'm pretty sure that the negativity that we would find there is even several magnitudes lower than the end of our sample um, of, uh, of the newspaper articles that we have uh, uh, studied. So the question is, um, where do we go from here uh, now that we have this 200 years of backward looking economic sentiment?